Our next speaker that will wrap up the morning session is Terry Mesher. I've known Terry for many, many years. He works for ODA. He um, works heavily with the H2O Ohio program. And essentially, this has been a commitment from the state of Ohio to pay for practices that they think will start to accomplish some of the goals that we want. And that is a cleaner lake, better water quality, better usage of, noodles, of uh, nutrients, and both commercial fertilizer and livestock manure. So I'd like to have Terry come up and talk to you about some of the practices that they're working on, what they think is the direction they want to go forward from here as we try to resolve the issues we have with Lake Erie. Terry? Thanks, Glenn. Am I on? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I think Chris did an excellent job of kind of establishing the why for H2 Ohio. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program and what we're trying to accomplish. But, but first thing I'll say is, you know, we, we have had some discussion this morning. And as, as we look backwards over time, you know, I'm, I'm with ODA, the Division of Soil and Water Conservation. We work very closely with all the soil and water conservation districts across the state. And if I look prior to the H2 Ohio program and, and really probably going back to 2015, if we looked at our nutrient management efforts, they focused almost solely on livestock manure. And that livestock manure that we focused on, we were trying to write manure nutrient management plans to a phosphorus standard and, and make the best use of the nitrogen that we could. With, with the onset of the Toledo water crisis in 2014, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms at the state that started to go into place. Um, we had um, um, certificate or a fertilizer certification um, code that, that went into place requiring all producers that are applying fertilizer to get a certification um, through Ohio State University Extension. Uh, the following year, we had Senate Bill 1, which eliminated or put restrictions on the application of commercial fertilizers and animal manure within the Western Lake Erie Basin onto frozen or snow-covered ground. But when we started to work on H2 Ohio, and, and H2 Ohio was, was, is a program that was brought into place by, by the DeWine administration, first introduced in, in the summer of 2019, or the summer of, yeah, the summer of 2019 um, as a proposal. And this was our first attempt, ODA's first attempt at looking at nutrient management across a broad spectrum or across all cropland. And that's really what we're trying to do. So if we look at H2 Ohio, it's a state funded program. Um, the program's managed and delivered by Ohio EPA, ODNR, and then lastly, ODA. Our focus, ODA's focus, is looking at focusing on the reduction of nutrients, primarily phosphorus, but also nitrogen, um, being fed to Lake Erie from the Western Lake Erie Basin. And what we're looking to do is accomplish that through better nutrient management, number one, um, better erosion management, number two, and lastly, the water management. When we start talking about the water management, that really gets to be a little bit tougher to start to develop a program to work through that. Because... If we look at nutrient management, nutrient management is something that happens in every field, every cropland field every year. We have some sort of activity going on. And that's a decision that's made by one individual operator or a family. Um, erosion management is much the same. Those are management decisions that are made on that individual field annually. But if we look at water management, water management, if we're actually going to complete that or satisfy that, number one, it's not just an annual decision, it's a long-term decision. Um, if we're gonna manage water, chances are we need some space to manage that water. We can't do man water management in a row crop field, typically. Now there's some cases where you can, but typically if you're gonna store and slow down water, you're gonna change land use from one use to, to holding that water. So we're a little lagging a little bit behind on the water management side of it and some of the practices. I'll talk a little bit about those here a little bit later. Um, so I've shown you our project area and currently for the Maumee watershed project area, those are the counties there in green. Those are the 14 counties that make up the vast majority of the Maumee watershed. Um, 2021 was the first year we started to deliver programming, the actual practices, the best management practices that H2 Ohio offers. We rolled the program out in February of 2020. The whole world shut down due to COVID through 2020. By the time we got back up on our feet, it was too late really to do any practices in 2020. So we slid ahead to 2021. 
Um, with that, right now, what we've got is in this, in this green area, those 14 counties, we have approximately 1,600 producers across those 14 counties who are currently enrolled in H2 Ohio. Um, the existing contracts for that, for that 14 county area will extend for 2022 practices as well as 2023 practices. So we've got contracts on, on with those 1,600 producers that extend through what I'm going to call crop year 2023. Um, to date, we have encumbered about $80 million to those, um, those 14 counties. Uh, we're going to commit some additional funds in 22 and 23. We're trying to look at and starting to report on the completed practices for 2021 to inform how we encumber those dollars and what counties we encumber those dollars to. So um, <clears throat> with that, you know, uh, Chris kind of alluded that, that we're working on some of the water management, but the, the practices shaded there in that light green, that's, that's really what we rolled out as far as our first H2 Ohio offering goes. And, you know, full disclosure, we made some mistakes as we rolled that out. Um, I, I tell uh, some of my H2 Ohio staff all the time that, that in 2020, in February of 2020, we expected we had about $30 million in the pot that we were going to dedicate to H2 Ohio. And we expected, you know, the, the end of January, beginning of February in 2020, we were anticipating, look, if we can get 150,000 to maybe 200,000 acres enrolled in the program, we'll be doing good. And that's kind of what we had our, our $30 million budget built around, never anticipating what the interest would be. We open, we start taking enrollment on February 4th of 2020. And by March 31 of 2020, we had over 1.1 million acres enrolled. And we had an ask for those four years originally of, of nearly $180 million. So first we, we, grossly misunderstood or misjudged what the interest would be. But two, the interest coming from the producers was huge. And, and it was it well exceeded anything we would have expected. And that forced us to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, this, this, this program overall is looking like it's five times of what we originally thought. So we had to retool some things. Um, if we're gonna focus a program on, on reducing nitrogen and phosphorus, the very first place that we thought we should is looking at the nutrient management plans themselves. The nutrient management plan is a central part to everything we're doing within the program. If a producer wants to get a payment for cover crops, they have to follow their nutrient management plan. If they want to get paid for VRT or phosphorus placement, they have to follow the nutrient management plan first. So, so the nutrient management plan is not only the ticket, to get into the program to start to receiving payments, but it's also that annual maintenance that you have to follow it in order to, to receive uh, program incentives. Um, enrollment exceeded 1.1 million acres um, across the 14 counties. Um, my math is probably a little bit off here, so I apologize. Um, but over those 14 counties, there's roughly 2.7 million acres of cropland in those 14 counties as a whole. We decided to deliver, to deliver the program on the county, at the county boundary, makes delivery of the program for the soil and water districts a lot easier. You don't have to decide if this farm is in or out. You don't have to decide what part of this field is in the watershed out. So, so uh, but that is somewhere around 40% of the cropland in the total project area. These are the practices that we're, we're come, uh, going through. As I said, number practice number one is the, is the nutrient management plan. But if we look at nutrient management, uh, the, the ones in gold there, really what we're trying to do is once we got the plan in place, then we're looking at trying to reduce losses by improved application and um, timing and the application methods, placement, um, in-season um, applications, some of those sort of things. Um, subsurface placement really gets us pretty excited um, for its potential to reduce phosphorus losses, but it's also an expensive um, act to complete. So those are some of the things that we're looking at for the nutrient management plan. I'll talk more specifically about manure incorporation here um, as I go through the slideshow. For the, for the erosion management, those are really kind of twofold. For the erosion management, um, we've got some conservation crop rotation. Um, it's either small grains, so we're looking at an overwintering annual 
uh, wheat, rye, maybe some barley, um, but also following it up with a double crop or a cover crop to maintain some covers. Really, we, the, the conservation crop rotation is either a, a perennial crop or it's a, it's a practice that takes about a year and a half or probably 16 months to get through from start to finish, as well as cover crops. And then lastly, our drainage water management, that's our uh, drainage water control structures up in the field. Um, this one, in all honesty, hasn't gotten a whole lot of my attention because through some of our programming in 2014, 2015, we had installed over 1,200 of these structures um, up within the Western Lake Erie Basin um, through some GLRI funds and nutrient reduction programming funds that we've had. Um, these are a little bit tricky. You got to have flat ground to adapt them to an existing tile system. And we, while we have several counties that are extraordinarily flat, um, once we get out of that little area, the ability to adapt those to an existing tile system, um, it, it's not really there. T typically, the ground just rolls too much um, to adapt that existing drainage system to that. So when I talk about a nutrient management plan and, and the why, way, the reason why we saw it as foundational is... If, if we wanted to reduce phosphorus load, we thought the easiest place to do it, the first place to do it, is really to be critical of the phosphorus applications that are taking place every year. Um, so this is our typical, just a picture of our nutrient management plan. Probably as we've gone through the program and as we have developed and approved nutrient management plans, the biggest discussion that we've had, the biggest influence that we've had to date is right here, using the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide as the Bible to make those nutrient recommendations. Um, it was my position before we ever started the program that if a fertilizer buggy or if a piece of equipment's going across the ground and they're applying fertilizer, they've done parts and pieces of this. For the most part, the soil tests are there. For the most part, the crop rotation and yield are there. The nutrient recommendation, however, that is, is developed um, right there, to putting that and, and relying on Tri-State Fertilizer Guide to make that recommendation has probably been the biggest point of discussion, the biggest change as we've worked our way through these, these plans. Um, so it's been a learning process for everybody. And I think as we look at the program, one of the things that we're really starting to see is as we, as we look at this nutrient management plan and the development of that, we're really looking at our educational opportunity with that producer to say, Let's look at your soil tests and let's look at what you're doing from a fertility basis. And, and let's get you in a position where you can say, do I need phosphorus? Do I need nitrogen going on there? That's, that's the first part to start getting long-term adoption of these things. Um, if we look at our nutrient application practices, we've got variable rate phosphorus application. Again, that's VRT. Um, that's pretty well accepted across the industry. Um, we, we follow NRCS 590 standards for the state of Ohio as far as what those requirements are. And that's probably, Kip, that's been our biggest, our biggest practice solely. I think we got about a half a million acres signed up for that originally. Um, phosphorus placement, um, for us, that's the one that probably shows the most promise in reaching that 40% re reduction goal that uh, Chris mentioned this morning. And we have, we've had, had to work with producers quite a bit. Our phosphorus placement standard requires that from going from the fertilizer cart directly to the ground, into the ground in one pass. Um, as we rolled the program out, we had a whole lot of folks that wanted to do a broadcast application and then incorporate it with tillage. No, I mean, you're, you're doing that anyway. Um, we wanted to get placement directly. Um, and, and for that, you know, our placement, what we did was, was we started to estimate, okay, what's the cost for, for an ag retailer, for a nutrient service provider, to go across those acres, what would they charge to do that? And uh, you know, if we looked at some data from 2015, 2016, we were coming up with a cost to, to run across just the application cost of about 20 to $30 an acre, depending on the rig, depending on the setup. So that's, that's, kind of, that's pretty much where we put that placement incentive is at that 20 or $30 an acre. With that though, once we started to make that investment in that, the other part of the contract is, is if you enter a field into phosphorus placement, all the phosphorus that gets put on that field for the life of the contract has to be placed. So, you know, it, it's a long-term commitment. Um, and then lastly, the manure incorporation. And with manure incorporation, um, really what we're trying to accomplish, probably about three or four different things with manure incorporation. But the reason why manure incorporation is, is so important to us 
is not only to improve the application practice for the manure itself, um, but also one of the things that we've done within the manure incorporation, we understand that the manure phosphorus is in the watershed. It's not going to go out. I mean, we have a lot of poultry manure and poultry manure can move in and out. It's a commodity, but in general, the manure that is produced in the watershed is going to get applied in the watershed. The commercial fertilizers, however, they're imported from, from the north, from the south, from the east, and the west. So if we could build a program in which we are taking manure nutrients and replacing commercial fertilizers with those manure nutrients, those all of a sudden were nutrients that then no longer come into the watershed. And that's really what we were trying to, to change up. Um, again, with a, with a, with a uh, goal of reduced phosphorus um, applications, better uh, timing uh, methods. Um, so we've had a lot of interest in those, those practices. And, and truth be told, our soil and water district folks have learned a lot through that. ODA folks have learned a lot through that. Farmers have taught us a lot um, on that side. I think we've gotten more of the education on that side of things than given the education. Um, for the erosion reduction practices, um, we're looking at some conservation crop rotation, either a small grains or perennial forages. Um, haven't had a lot of interest in the perennial forages to date. Um, just, they just, we just haven't. Um, I think out of all of our sign up, we're somewhere in the range of maybe 50,000 acres signed up in the forages. But the overwintering cover crops or the, over, the, the small grains, we've had a lot of interest in. We've had a lot of folks that are trying to get back to bringing wheat into the rotation. And the interesting thing with wheat is we've got a different, a different schedule. Um, we're harvesting wheat in July typically, and that opens up a summer manure or a summer nutrient management window where we've got less chances of runoff. We've got warm soil temperatures. So we've got nutrients that we would apply, um, get to become part of the soil, go through that process. So we're also building several other, other components into the, the uh, small grains. It's not just growing wheat. These practices, we're looking at trying to manage the erosion. I think we've done a really good job at the state level of reducing erosion overall across the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, I think our sediment yields, and I'll, I'll defer to Chris if he's still in the room, but I think our sediment yields coming out of, the, out of the Western Basin over the last 25 years is down probably somewhere in the range of 25 to 35% compared to where it was in the early 90s. So we've done an excellent job at, at uh, keeping those sediments in place. And we just wanted to continue that effort. Um, for the drainage water or for the water management, when we start to talk about that, I, I said that we're already doing some drainage water management, um, but um, we're looking to DNR to do some other, some other parts of that. As Chris mentioned, DNR is looking at uh, headwater and coast, coastal flow through wetlands. Um, right now through, through the, the um, Lake Erie CREP, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. Um, since H2 Ohio started, we've got about an additional 150 wetlands that will be constructed either this year or next year across those 24 counties. Um, and those are specifically within the, the, within the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, so that's gonna be a huge engineering effort and a huge construction effort. Those are typically gonna be smaller wetlands on agricultural ground um, to be eligible for that program. Uh, we are developing um, a, a framework to incentivize the construction of two-stage ditches. Um, we were going to try to run, ro roll two-stage ditches out initially, but again, as we look at drainage work across Northwest Ohio, that's usually a multi-landowner project. Um, it's very rare that you see much of a, a ditch project only include one landowner. So if we're going to do a petition ditch project, we wanted to work with some of our existing public drainage processes, um, specifically uh, the county engineers petition ditch process and the uh, soil and water conservation districts conservation works of improvement to incentivize those. Um, we're gonna have a, a, our first formal meeting on that, uh, talking to county engineers and interested soil and water districts here in May with, a, with the plans to release an RFP a little bit later this year to start looking at some proposed projects. Um, so those are where we're at. And, and the other thing that we're working on with the, um, with ODNR is when we start to look at water management, if we're looking at water management across the agricultural landscape, um, really it, it takes time, but it also, you know, if we look at, if we look at, uh, 
urban or suburban development, we've got stormwater regulations. We've got retention ponds that are required. We've got a lot of those things. We don't have that across the agricultural landscape. If we look at the changes in precipitation over the last 15 or 20 years, um, some of the drivers that we've seen from this increased phosphorus loss, about a third of it is just due to increased runoff. So as we look at that, we're working with DNR to start to develop a program of looking at stormwater management across the rural landscape. Um, we've looked into uh, Wisconsin, They're, they've got an effort, the Agricultural Treatment uh, Runoff System, ARTS is what they call it, which is basically a sediment basin and a wetland. We're looking at how we could start to develop some of those processes, um, how we could incentivize those. So, so that's early on at the inception. Really for, for ODA, what we're looking to do is, is work with agriculture to look at row crops, look at the working lands and develop annual practices and cropping practices that will help. We're really looking to DNR to start to build some of that natural infrastructure through the wetlands and through some of these other um, water control structures uh, as well. So um, it's been a, a good learning process and we're, we're, we're working through, but certainly it's, it's been a monumental effort. If we look at the practice enrollment um, across these 14 counties, as I said, we've had about 1.1 million acres enrolled in, in, DR, or in, in uh, nutrient management plans, 500,000 plus acres originally enrolled in DRT, um, 300,000 acres enrolled in placement. Um, the interesting thing and the thing that we're kind of excited about is 170,000 acres um, in, in manure incorporation. That's roughly 6% of the overall land mass or the cropland area across the entire um, basin. So uh, it's pretty exciting, pretty big numbers. It's been a lot of work, um, as well as a 450,000 acres in the cover crops. So um, with the cover crops specifically, um, you know, we had a very, we had an extraordinarily wet fall last year. So some of these practices we didn't get in and we're working on ways to get more of those in earlier. Uh, we've got a couple of soil and water districts that are really pushing for interseeding um, cover crops at the time within corn during side dress time. So trying to figure out how that works, the, the chemical um, um, systems or the, the chemistry management to be able to control weeds, but not avoid or uh, eliminate the possibility of putting some cover crops in there as well. So again, program, I think we kind of repeated this all over, but all the nutrient application practices have to be in accordance with the, the approved VNMP. And really, the, again, I can't say it enough that the VNMP is really the cornerstone for the program. If we, if we look at uh, the manure incorporation practice itself, um, there's a couple things that we're really trying to do with that. And, and this is probably our highest incentivized uh, practice. But as I said, we're trying to replace commercial nutrients with manure nutrients, number one. If we're gonna do that, we've gotta incentivize it high enough to accomplish two things. One, is to offset the cost from, from somebody that might be receiving manure from a neighboring livestock farm, because there are challenges with receiving that manure. There's also risks. Um, we've got a lot of subsurface drainage in Northwest Ohio. Most of the manure is liquid manure. So there's, a, there's always the chance of runoff. Um, we've had some historically wet years the past five or 10 years. So even if you look at the forecast and you do all your manure application right, mother nature might come by with a storm a day or two later and, and push some of that manure off. So there is risk there. There's also transportation costs. Um, it's, it's not cheap to haul a material that's 95% water very far down the road. Hauling water for us in Ohio in a humid environment doesn't pay. We don't need the water. We need the nutrients, not the water. So as we set the, the whole program up, that's kind of what our goals were, is to get producers of manure to engage with their neighbors, as looking at that as a nutrient source rather than a waste to be disposed of. We've also encouraged people without livestock that have a lot of row crop to start seeking out manure in their neighborhood or within a reasonable distance. So it's been really exciting with that part of it. Um, within, our, within our guidance for that, um, we've got some very specific ways that the manure has to be applied. We're trying to take advantage of the nitrogen with a spring application uh, we've really relied heavily on some of uh, Glenn's work where we're using manure as a side dress nitrogen source for, for corn specifically. 
using uh, liquid manure as a top dress for wheat in the spring. That's worked out fairly well. The limited amount of, that we've done that, we're trying to get some more equipment in the state to do that more. So those are some of our spring applications. And then in the fall, if they apply the manure after July 1st, they have to apply the manure as a producer, apply the manure. And then after it's applied, we need something in that soil to start to take up the nitrogen that we just applied. So either follow up that manure application with a double crop soybean, they can do what they want with the, with the double crop, harvest the, the double crop soybean, or follow it up with a cover crop. Um, and then after that, they have to let that cover crop remain fallow until March 15th the following year. So we don't have tillage following up. Again, that comes back in with, with part of that erosion reduction. The other unique part of the program overall, and I, sh I should have hit this, I apologize, <clears throat> is when we looked at the program, we wanted it to be as flexible as possible for the producer. And they could build that, the H2 Ohio, what they did on an individual partial or an individual field to fit their management practices. So as a producer signing up for the program, they can pick and choose which practices fit which field, which years. And that, that's really been a benefit to the producer. I think that's part of the reason why we had the enormous interest that we've done. But I will tell you from a program management standpoint, it really, really makes it complicated because all of a sudden you get into a conversation with a producer and you think you've got a pretty well straightforward path on how we're going to work through this crop rotation and then you get an if or an and or a but. And what we've learned is, is that really quickly, every producer has a unique system that the producer has to explain to the soil and water district. And then the soil and water district personnel have to be in a position where they know enough of the practices, know enough of the program to explain to the producer what they can and can't do within that system. And that was probably, uh, from, from our perspective at ODA, that was our biggest oversight. We achieved making a flexible program. We achieved making a program that was really liked by the producers. We had no clue and had no understanding of how complicated it would be to work our way through that program once we started to institute it. So, but as I said, we've, we've been learning a lot on, on all things. And in the manure corporation practice, the other thing that we do with that is, is if a producer has manure, if they're generating manure, their voluntary nutrient management plan gets translated into a comprehensive nutrient management plan for the, for the manure producer. But we also come in in each field where they're going to do that manure incorporation. Prior to, the incor or prior to that manure application, they have to sit down with the district and basically put together a manure application plan for that field. And what we wanted to do is essentially we came up with a calculator that follows all of our H2 Ohio guidelines, follows all the 590 guidelines, and it ensures that what we're planning to do on that field will, will match up with the, what, what we need to have for the program. So um, because we do have a higher bar than just 590 within that application requirement. Um, as we look at where we're at today, uh, we're, we're building some of our reporting on the 2021 practices. Uh, for 20, going into early 2021, we had to have our nutrient management plan submitted. So we had just a little over 1.1 million acres enrolled in contracts in 2020. Um, as of about February 1st this year, we had about 920,000 acres in VNMPs that were developed submitted to the Soil and Water District, reviewed, and approved. So that's 920,000 acres of these plans that are based on a current soil test, so soil test less than four years old, that are using Tri-State Fertilizer Guide as the guiding document and are following the NPK recommendations within, that, within the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide. So again, um, we did have some cancellations. I think within the, the excitement about signing up for, for H2 Ohio, we had some producers that ran into the soil and water office. They signed up, didn't truly understand what the expectations and requirements for the program were. So we have have had some, about 10% fall off. And we have have had some also that we're still waiting on. And, and my guess at this point in time would be is that we'll probably, the vast majority of those acres in yellow, will probably end up losing. Um, not that they're just don't have the interest, don't have the drive to follow through with the program because there is a fair amount of paperwork and documentation that has to come in behind it. <clears throat> We're gonna be reporting on the 2021 practices. 
um, here in the second half of May, first part of June. Um, a lot of about half of our practices have requirements that extend it all the way until March 15th. Um, our, our overwintering cover crop has has a March 15th requirement attached to it. Our our over or our uh, small grains, our our conservation crop rotation has has a, an extension into March 15th. All of our manure incorporation practices extend into March 15th. So so we're going to be doing a final report, and those we'll probably start pulling those numbers about the middle of May. Um, so to give the soil and water districts a little bit of time to process those payments, get through their soil and water board meeting. And, uh, and, and finalize their reporting um, within our data management system. Um, the other thing that we really learned through this whole thing is, and, and one of the challenges we're working on is within all of this, with, we're working on a program and we're, we're tracking what we accomplish. We're recording it digitally, but these 1600 producers that we have signed up for 1.1 million acres of practices we didn't have any software as we started this to manage that effort. So every bit of, of management within this program is being done on a paper contract. So that's the other challenge within all of this. And that's one of the things that we're trying to address as we move forward. Uh, probably prevent some of my hair from turning an additional shade of gray. So um, we have expanded um, in second half of 2021, we expanded into 10 additional counties. Uh, these counties in yellow, we call it our WLEB expansion. And the, how we selected these counties is we wanted any ground in the state of Ohio that was draining into the Western Lake Erie Basin to have an opportunity to participate in H2 Ohio. So we expanded to the 10 counties in yellow here. Um, we've got nearly 620,000 acres of cropland enrolled in the BNMP development. Um, I think that's roughly 32 or 33% of the overall cropland in that, in that 10 county area. We've had over 62,000 acres of small grains and over 130,000 acres of overwintering cover crops. With this sign up, we learned from our first one. Our first sign up, we had producers without a nutrient management plan signing up for every practice all the same day. It was kind of like herding cats at a golf scramble. Um, it was terrible. So what we decided was, you know, the nutrient management plan is the foundation of the program. We need to know what that is before we start talking to producers about the nutrient application practices. So phase one, we're gonna take in um, applications for the nutrient management plans. We also allowed folks to sign up for the, the small grains that, uh, that establishes an opportunity to apply and participate in the manure incorporation practice this coming year, as well as the overwintering cover crops. We were very confident in delivering those practices because they're not nutrient management dependent. Um, we pretty much said, you can go ahead. We don't need to know everything about your crop rotation, your soils to start forward on that. Um, we're offering in, in, in phase one, we offered those three practices. Uh, we are currently accepting applications across those 10 counties for all of the practices, all the ones that are shaded there for 2023, 2024, and 2025. Um, same practices, same practice um, guidelines, same practice standards a little bit of a shift in our overall payment structure. Um, we touted for a year and a half that the nutrient management plan was the foundation for the program. And we, we based that strictly off of what we anticipated the costs being. So in our first rollout, the nutrient management plan development, hey, it's pretty cheap to develop that on a commercial fertilizer side, $2 an acre is our payment. Well, if it's the foundation of the program and we've got somebody that has high soil test levels, and doesn't need to do a whole bunch of nutrient applications, there's nothing really there in the program for. So as we did it, rolled it out the second time, we had to adjust the nutrient management plan development and implementation up quite a bit. It's up to $10 an acre, and we've pulled some of the payments down for the different commercial fertilizer application practices. So we're learning, is it, is it perfect yet? No, it's not perfect yet, but we are identifying some of those flaws in our, our original concept and trying to adjust them as we roll the program forward. Um, we're looking to have those contracts finalized with an ODA signature on them in, in June and July, um, such that uh, some of these folks that might want to do some manure incorporation after a wheat harvest have the ability to do that in August. Um, <clears throat> Chris mentioned a little bit of, about the overall um, commitment that the state of Ohio has put towards this. Um, by the end of next fiscal year, by the end of fiscal year 2023, Ohio will have committed somewhere in the range of about $200 million 
to H2 Ohio through ODA alone. Uh, phenomenal funding level. We've never seen this kind of funding in any conservation practice or uh, program through the state of Ohio. I, I'm looking to some of my conservation friends here, but I think previous to this, the biggest effort we would have had would have been maybe that was state funded, might have been uh, pollution abatement program statewide that would have provided maybe $1.5 million worth of funds. So uh, it, it's completely outstripped anything we've done in the past. Um, <clears throat> we will be encumbering some of those funds as we move forward. The challenge as we look forward, and I think it's on the next slide, um, the challenge that we have looking forward is everything we've got as far as H2 Ohio funds is dependent on the biennium budget. With a biennium budget, the structure that it is, we have to have those funds basically encumbered by the end of the, the, the uh, biennium budget. So we got a lot of money, we've got a lot of things going on, but we have to have all those funds committed by June 30 of 2023, and we got no money after that. So our flexibility is, is really kind of limited. Um, we are gonna start to build the plans for what we're gonna do in Western Lake Erie Basin in 24, 25 and beyond. We're gonna start to build those plans, but we can't really act on those plans until we get that final budget. And we'll know what that final budget is in July of 2023. <clears throat> we're gonna, as we look at the future program, I think some of the general themes that are gonna come out, um, we're gonna continue to look at nutrient loss across the rural landscape is gonna be our focus. We are definitely gonna have a footprint in the Western Lake Erie Basin because of the challenges that we have within Lake Erie itself, but, uh, these are Ohio's funds that are going in. The taxes that are used to pay for this are coming from statewide. So ultimately we will be reaching out across the state. It's just a matter of timing and when. But we're also gonna work at continuing to build the producer's knowledge and understanding of the nutrient management plants. Um, the, the agriculture is a very traditional uh, industry. And I think one of the things and, and probably the best way that I can say it is we're really trying to break down some, some management uh, practices that have been in place for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Grandpa did it that way, he always made money. Dad did it that way, he always made money. That's the way I'm gonna do it. And with our educational process, really what it comes down to is, is convincing a producer, number one, that they can change up what they're doing without impacting their yield. And the way we want to do that is, is going through on the nutrient management side, looking at that soil test, looking at the nutrient recommendations, and giving that producer enough confidence to look at their ag retailer and say, why? Why do I need that phosphorus? Do I need all that nitrogen? If we can accomplish that and start a more honest conversation between those two individuals, I think we've probably accomplished about 60% of our goal. I might be wrong, but that's really where we're seeing our effort on that front. Um, <clears throat> And it is a, it's a long-term effort, um, but it's a challenging one. It's a re rewarding one as well. Um, some of the research that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> when we started down this road, the, our understanding of the control of phosphorus from the crop field through the drainage system into the, the network of streams and rivers into the lake, it's pretty nominal and trying to connect those management practices with a phosphorus reduction is even more challenging. So we're working with Ohio State on a pilot watershed. Um, the pilot watershed is looking in a watershed in Hardin County. And really what the goal with that is, is looking at if we take this watershed and we focus in on a couple practices, but get that adoption across 70% of the cropland plus, will we impact the discharge from that watershed. We have a watershed that already has about three and a half to four years of water quality monitoring on it, both, both quality and quantity. So we could do load calculations on that. Um, we're gonna start signing up. It's already in the H2 Ohio program, Ohio State through, a, um, through an RCPP grant from, uh, from NRCS will be providing additional um, funds, additional incentives, as well as additional staff to target sign up in that watershed. So we're pretty excited about that. That's gonna last for five years. So starting this fall and, and continue through crop year 2027. Um, we're also working with ARS, Dr. Kevin King, at trying to build some better modeling to connect 
the data that we have at the edge of the field to watershed wide modeling. Um, there's, there's, it's very hard to connect the data and the results that we have at the edge of the field to a larger watershed level SWOT model, some of those sort of things to understand the connectivity there. So we've got a, a three year effort working with them. And then lastly, and certainly not least, this is one that, that we just got the, the ink dried on the agreement is we're working with the, the Blanchard River Demonstration Farms, um, which is funded by both NRCS and the Ohio Farm Bureau to look at these practices from the producer standpoint. You know, it's, it's really easy for me as a program manager to tell a producer, hey, you need to do this. You need, it's simple, you need to look at these things. But when we, I look at it from the producer standpoint, I'm throwing a, a money amount that he can get paid if he does all these things. But I'm not sure that I understand what the management costs are for that producer, what the agronomic impact is potentially for that producer, and what the overall cost benefit or profit loss changes are. So those are some of the things that we're working with um, the Demonstration Farms Network with Ohio Farm Bureau to develop some of that information, to develop some of the fact sheets to, to, to explain some of those things. So uh, I think that's all. So Glenn, if I got time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Take a couple minutes for questions, then we'll need to uh, break apart so we can rearrange the rooms. So the question was, is what's the total nutrient balance across the watershed? And that's a, that's a great question. Um, we've, we've been looking at that um, for about the last two and a half, three months. Um, as we look at commercial fertilizers, um, well, let's back up a little bit. If we look at nutrient removal um, from the crop rotations and the yields typically found across the watershed, our typical phosphorus consumption across the watershed is somewhere in the range of 55 pounds per acre, depending on the year, 52 to 60. Um, so that's our consumption. If we look, and, and Greg Labarge is in the room somewhere, and he kind of spearheaded some of this work, and my hat's off to you, Greg. Um, looking at some of the data that we have from the Division of Plant Industry for, with ODA, um, we've seen a downward trend in commercial fertilizer applications. Um, looking back to 2008 or 2002, somewhere in there, we've seen an overall drop of about, Greg, help me out, confirm this, but I want to say somewhere in the 20 to 25% range. Not that it's statistically significant because in that time we only got 12 data points. So we got to take that into mind, but we've seen a good downward trend. And I think um, we're seeing a lot more consumption of phosphorus than the application of phosphorus when it comes to commercial fertilizers. We're starting to look at that same work through animal manures. Um, we have seen quite a bit of growth in animal livestock across the watershed going back. Um, probably seen, saw that curve inflect and start to go back up somewhere in the 97 to 2000 range. Um, we're looking at that and trying to assess that. Um, overall, if we look at our animal increase versus phosphorus production increase, it's not a one-to-one -one match because we do have a lot of technology um, the phytase in, in uh, animal feeds has really reduced some of that. So we're trying to build that into our model as well, as well as looking at biosolids. And I think if we stacked all of those together, um, if just guessing right now, I would say that we're fairly close to balanced. I would say that we've spent quite a bit of time from 2010 and previously in a pretty dramatic surplus than what we are today. And now that said, I think our goal um, through what we're doing with H2 Ohio is, is to start to be really critical of some of those phosphorus management zones and see if we can't be a little bit more critical and start to push those down a little bit more without sacrificing yield. That's the key. Um, you know, we look at the tourism industry with Lake Erie, and that's an industry that gets measured in billions of dollars to the state of Ohio. The ag industry is an industry that gets measured in billions of dollars to the state of Ohio. So we've got to figure out a way for, for all of these to coexist without destroying the industry. So I think that's really what our goal is. Okay. 